good morning everybody uh, the outset i thank uh, scientific committee for giving us this uh, opportunity and accepted our instruction course so today we'll be talking about the cracking astigmatism i am the chief instructor for uh, today's course so you all know that uh, the refining astigmatism correction has been become a reality for the modern ophthalmologist and control of astigmatism plays a vital role in this quest for optical refractive outcomes so we have got a galaxy of speaker to start with rohit shetty i think everybody knows about him he is the uh, ophthalmologist come scientist and who has done a lot of work as far as the cornea refractive and the research work in indian ophthalmology i can say he is one of the star in indian ophthalmology so he'll be talking about relevance of topography in astigmatism management we have got a uh, we have got dr sunil ganekal who has been uh, like he is a past scientific committee chairman karnataka ophthalmic society he'll be talking on tackling pseudophagic gastric mandism dr anand dodrame gowda is a prolific phaco refractive surgeon from kaimatur uh, he'll be talking about astigmatism management in keratoconus then how we control the astigmatism with the help of toric eye cell which has been tell us to dr sunapa the uh, director of iksha eye hospital also visiting consultant to prasad netralaya and we have got dr hari prasad okuda he'll be talking about post keratoplasty astigmatism management he is a director of sri hari netralaya udupi so it's over to you rohit thank you sir uh, yeah. you have to stop sharing your screen yeah So, first speaker, you have to uh, Purnima. You have to fix the timer twelve minutes. Okay. All right, sir. Is it uh, clear, sir? Can you hear me? Yes, sir. Clear, yeah, right. Please go ahead. So, relevance of uh, topography in uh, management of astigmatism is my talk today. These are my financial interests. So, before we go into the uh, understanding the uh, topography cylinder of uh, from the topography, we have to understand the basic of astigmatism. The two important things for a refractive surgeon: one is what is manifest, and the other one is the tomographic uh, astigmatism. Manifest comes from your refraction. The tomography comes from your pentacam or any topographers which you use you can use the true net power the total corneal uh, refractive power map these are the ones which looks at the posterior anterior cornea and algebraic sum of it this is uh, something which we all know the orientation of axis what is with the room astigmatism what is against the rule astigmatism and what is oblique astigmatism all this uh, are something which we have been aware of and i don't want to go into this what is a sphere made up of sphere is made up of your refraction your myopia or your hypermetropia which is defocus and your spherical aberration what is cylinder made up of lot of aberrations of which astigmatism is one secondary the comas the trifoil and the mix of all this that's how the cylinder is made up of that's why this is very complex to understand because it's mix of multiple things what is a total astigmatism the cornea from your anterior the posterior cornea here the epithelium plays an turn and your lens all this makes up the total it includes the epithelium also and the lens and everything else this is a simple example of this the anterior corneal the posterior corneal look at the axis and the internal is a lens and your epithelium even the epithelium also contributes to the cylinder now if you look at this division here the in this case the epithelium does not have any cylindrical component it's zero it's more of sphere that means a minus 0.5 it's a perfect epithelium the total corneal is mix of anterior which tells you this is your cylinder in that it tells you this are the higher order aberration and also it has a small amount of posterior which is completely on opposite side which is how it works and your internal this is from the lens you can see that a healthy one which gives you a perfect uh, cylindrical component which is the, the lenticular one when your epithelium is regular you don't have a cylinder 
But when your epithelium is irregular, this is a contact lens patient or a dry eye patient, what you see here is this forms a cylinder here. And this amounts to a diopter of cylinder. So it is important to understand the epithelium in understanding the cylinder because normally we look at the corneal surface and we look at the posterior surface and we say this is what is the corneal cylinder. But if epithelium is irregular and some places, this amounts for this change out here. Look at this change. This is your corneal. It's a two diopter astigmatism. The epithelial thickness is irregular and this amounts to a one diopter from the epithelium. And this is very important for us to understand because out of this two, one diopter is from your optics. The other one diopter is from your epithelium. So this is a very important uh, statement which every refractive surgeon should be aware of in your practice. And this is what you probably would be seeing when you're actually going to treat this patient. And if you don't treat, understand this, you may have a very unhappy vision. This is also the second thing is when your manifest refraction does not match with your topographic astigmatism. Now question is why? For example, this is your refraction. This is your measure. Measured is your topography. Measured is topography. You can see here, here it matches. Here topography is more than the manifest. Here manifest is more than the topography. Now what do we do with it? How do you go, up, go about with this? This could be misalignment. It could be regular cornea, tear film, opacity, so lenticular. For example, when the topolizer measured is equal, that means your corneal, if we're looking at this cornea and your lens, what I'm measuring here is the accommodation. This is very important because to understand the cylinder, you have to measure the accommodation properly. So if your cornea and lens are all very synchronous, then you get this kind of a picture. If your cornea, if your lens is more than accommodating more than uh, the, uh, the cornea, is cornea is more than the lens, then you get this kind of a picture where the topography and astigmatism is more than the manifest. Here, what happens is your lens is red, this means you are still accommodating more. So the lens is more than the cornea. That means your subjective refraction is more than the topoclet. So Topography more than manifest, manifest more than topography. Remember this very clearly. When this is more, that means that the cornea is at culprit. When this is more, it means that your lens is at culprit because this accommodative space, accommodative changes are very important in understanding this scenarios. And this exactly picturizes it. This is your cylinder from the topography. And you can see that they're all measured from the cornea. They are all topographic cylinder. And this you can see is whatever is coming here is from your topography. And you can see that this is a topography once, which is coming from the topography. Those topography is more than the manifest out here, which is very important. Here, it's a very important one. The topography is uh, normal, but the lens is one which is having the more thing. So that means manifest is more than topography. That means you have to be very careful in this patient because this patient may be having an accommodative spasms or pseudo accommodative issues or convergence or accommodation excess. Very, very important scenario is this. Never forget this part because if your topography says one and a half diopters of cylinder, but your patient is accepting three diopters of cylinder, that means you are in trouble. And then you have to be very careful. These are the patient you need. Uh, very, very, very good cyclophagic refraction, fogging, and do every kinds of stuff. And in these cases, when everything matches, 1.4 diopters matching with this, 1.2 diopters is higher. That means topography is higher. That's okay. But manifest higher is always a big challenge. So this is an important point for a refractive surgeon. So how do you treat the cylinders? Basic approach. These are all the approaches we have known. Uh, when the manifest is exactly what I said, oblique, See, these are all the scenarios, you know, of uh, with the rule, against the rule, manifest more, topography, uh, topography more. Remember one thing, there are only two scenarios. Manifest is more or a topography is more. You have to figure out how do you go about with this. Because if you create a with the rule astigmatism to an against the rule astigmatism, the patient will be terribly unhappy. But against the rule becoming with the rule, he's happy. So always remember this part of it very clearly. And this is just the scenarios for all refractive surgeons. So what do we do? Always keep 
the same direction. Never make ones with the rule to against the rule and try not to overcorrect. And you can always correct sometimes. If there's against the rule, with the rule will always be better, not the other way around. And how, do you, how does the laser surgery today correct? This is a very important question. All the cylinders today are usually corrected on the plus cylinder axis. Even if you have a minus three at 180 degrees, the machine, what it actually corrects is always plus three at 90 degrees. This is how it corrects. And it's important for us to understand. So these are all how the lasers corrects. But look at this. If you have a, even a minus three cylinder, the machine automatically makes it as a plus cylindrical form so that it does not, it ablates in the periphery. It is always, it ablates more on the, on the weaker axis to make it, to, to make the uh, flatter axis to become steeper. And look at this, uh, even like I said, this is, this is a simple example of this. And it's, this is how the machine actually works on the laser. So I'll just go to this pattern. Yeah, this is a very important thing. Let's assume that you're treating a minus 2.75 at uh, five degrees. How does the machine do? It completely transpositions itself which you don't know. It actually treats a minus 2.75 sphere and plus 2.75 cylinder at 90 degrees. When you put in your machine, any of your machine, this is how a machine treats because it saves tissue and it's a very perfect one. So first, what does it do? It treats your myopia. So you'll be surprised. You'll have a pattern like this on your laser machine. You'll be wondering why is the machine burning here? It's because the machine actually transpositions itself, treats the minus 2.75 in the center, and then it treats the plus 2.75, even though your, your, your power you're correcting is only 2.75 cylinder. That is, this machine always corrects like this. And look at this, a 2.75 ablation, 40 microns, and the central ablation here is zero. So still your, your peripheral ablation is around 45 microns. This is why, your microns, this is how a machine treats. And this is exactly how it's correct. I don't want to go into this. This is an example of how an oblique uh, is treated or a mixed astigmatism is treated. So in summary, this is how all the treatment of your ablation is for a simple myopia, simple myopic astigmatism, compound myopic astigmatism, about how they actually treat in this. So how does Contura work? The Contura works in three levels. It looks at manifest cylinders, uh, how the difference is. It looks at the subjective cylinders and, uh, and also looks at all the three parameters which I just described about the manifest and the total astigmatism. It also looks at the abrasions and it also adds abrasion to this profile and then it makes uh, planning according to how you want to treat. So all these are uh, different types of it, which I don't want to go into this in this presentation, but we build a software, we incorporate everything. And this is only for the Contura, which incorporate all that I discussed here, including transposition in some cases, how it treats. And all you have to do is feed in, the machine has its own algorithm to treat and take care of it uh, very well. This is just a paper which was submitted, just shows how good this uh, kind of a software is. To summarize, understanding cylinder is very, very important. Rule one, when the manifest is less than the, the topo guided topo uh, uh, astigmatism, both in the same axis, less than 310 degrees, always treat the manifest astigmatism. Remember this manifest less than topography. That means topography more than the manifest. Always treat less than 10 degrees. And treat rule two, when there are manifest is more than topography and both are within the with the rule astigmatism treat always the topography astigmatism because the topography astigmatism is the one which compensates and always compensate for spherical equivalent. I mean, if you increase the topography, change the spherical, the sphere, that's, that's all everybody knows about it. If the manifest is more than the topography astigmatism and with the against the rule astigmatism, treat the manifest and convert the topography into with the rule, that's something which you can plan. And rule four is manifest oblique treat the topography. If it's an oblique, treat for topography with the spherical equivalent and adjust the manifest and with least astigmatism when they are different from uh, more than 10 degrees. Thank you and thank you Kudlu sir for this opportunity. Thank you Rohit for a wonderful talk. So just one question for you Rohit. I think you have been a master in a refractive surgery. 
most of the centers, I think, the, probably Narayan Netrala is the one center. I think you got a gadgets of equipment. I think you can take in uh, uh, reading in every equipment, but not all the refractive surgeons will have access to the, all the equipment. So my question to you, is it necessary to have a abrometer? Necessary to have a abrometer in your refractive practice? So if you want to do refractive practice, the best and the ideal way, then you have to invest on it. If you want to cut corners and say that, okay, I want to save a few, a few lakhs here and there, then it's okay. But if you want to see, there is something like doing with fitness. There is a, some concept we're doing just for the sake of doing. If you want to do something with fitness, if you want to do something as a perfect thing, then there's no question of not having it. And you can get abrometers today. Not, not all of them are very pricey and you, they will always pay back to you. No, For example, but position, oh, eye trace, the in position to eye trace, absolutely. the abrometer can pick up everything. Yeah, you can pick up. So I've used a lot of my eye tracing. For example, you come and sometimes you will have a patient who says that uh, you have a uh, topography cylinder is more or uh, see, for example, manifest astigmatism more than topography astigmatism is a very difficult issue. If you don't pick up internal aberrations of lens, which is creating a cylindrical change there, then you'll have a lot of challenges later. So in the end, you are showing about the contour. We just started to do actually, uh, we just did a few cases, even with the uh, regular uh, LASIK machine, examiner machine, Melaity, what I'm having since last eight, nine years. We started doing in a virgin corneas also topoguided treatment. But uh, of course, it takes a very less tissue if you compare with the wavefront guided treatment. But uh, the results are quite amazing. What I felt, see, whether it is a uh, uh, Alcon machine, whether it's a Zeiss machine, or whether it's a Swind, all three works on the same flying spot technology. I think each machine, I think, uh, because of this particular technology of flying spot, even topo guided treatment in a virgin cornea also gives the same results like a what counter. Contour might be having a one or two special future, but almost every machine of this flying spot will have the similar kind of result. That's what I felt. Absolutely, sir. Basically, what, what, what happens is if your cornea is, has a higher level of corneal abrasions, always do a topo-guided treatment because that will give you a better form of uh, treat correction than your regular one, whether you do Contour or Zeiss or any other plant. Thank you, Rohit, for a wonderful talk. Chinappa. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rohit. It was uh, lovely listening to your talk. And uh, now I would like to call upon Kudlu, our chief instructor, uh, to be speaking on Tori uh, in cataract surgery. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Dr. Chinappa. Once again, I thank uh, the AAS for this wonderful opportunity for including our uh, uh, instruction course part of the program. So I'll be talking about toric IOL, how it is really to tackle the astigmatism. So I don't have any financial disclosure for this particular talk. See, toric intraocular lens was first introduced by Shimizu in 1992. Since then, the increase in the predictability and enhanced IOL implantation has been firmly established. It has claimed universal approval to use correct preoperative astigmatism as low as 0.75 adapter in patients undergoing cataract surgery. Can any uh, admin, can you mute other persons? Thank you. So 20% of the patient with the cataract uh, has got astigmatism more than one adapter. So uh, it's very important whenever the patient comes to you, before you counsel them for cataract surgery, to know that their keratometer reading. Even if you have got an autorefractometer also, it takes a central 3mm of keratometry. That gives a fair amount of idea. Every incision on cornea induces additional astigmatism, that is a surgical induced astigmatism. Implantation of monofocal lens will uh, require a distance and near correction both in in these cases. But uh, we have been implanting bilateral toric IELTS, which gives high level of spectacle independence. So once again, patient selection, as I already said that, of course, regular astigmatism less than 0.75, do we have to really opt for toric IEL? So this is with the few three pictures, I think patient with a 0.25 cylinder and patient with a 0.75 cylinder and the patient with a one cylinder. You can see the overall picture, how their vision clarity. 
So coming to the toric intraocular lens power calculation, precise keratometry is very important. You need to know how much is your surgically induced astigmatism. Coming to the keratometry, you have got automated keratometer, you have got a corneal topographer and optical biometry. So K readings from all these shows high repeatability and comparable. So corneal topography is required in some cases of unusual reading and poor quality of mice. So coming to the surgical induced cali uh, the astigmatism calculation, always see how you have to know your own surgical induced calculation. So you make a chart, fill it for 20 to 30 case minimum, then obtain a SIA calculator, then you know how much is your surgical induced astigmatism. Then be precise about your axis and the incision. So coming to the IOL power calculation, uh, always axial length measurement should be done with the IOL master or lenser. However, even immersion uh, biometry, immersion ultrasound also may be used. But uh, make sure that when you're doing immersion, you have to sterilize this Prager cell very well. So only corneal astigmatism should be used for IOL calculation. So various companies have got their own calculators which can calculate the power according to the surgeon comfort. Also suggest the steepest axis for the incision, making thereby giving the least residual astigmatism. So let me come to the marking technique. Accurate ma marking of the alignment axis should be performed with the patient in an upright position in order to prevent the cyclotorsion. This is very important. Firstly, horizontal axis is marked preoperatively at the stent lamp with the coaxial, then you can turn the slit on to the 0 to 180 degree. Marking is either you can done marking with the bubble marker, you can some people even mark with the needle also, or some people even mark with the sterile ink. These are the top four errors that cause a disappoint in toric lens. That is mainly important is preoperative measurement error. Second one is incorrect marking on the reference cornea. A lot of people just mark, they won't take in front of the sit lamp. Then, of course, your marking might be wrong. Then you will land up in problem. One more important thing, incorrect placement of the lens. If you are marking, you are not seeing on the on table, then there may be chances of incorrect placement of the intraocular lens. Failure to take into the account impact liberty. Once again, I insist on the surgical induced astigmatism. So out of this incorrect marking, I can give the first, uh, I think, uh, disappointment. And second one is the incorrect placement of the intraocular lens. So for marking of the axis, there are different methods have been there in the market since last couple of years. Most of us till today do manual method, iris finger on printing technique, image guided systems now already there in the market and intraoperative abrometry, which is going to be the ultimate. The three step of manual marking method is fairly accurate. A mean error of a mean error of 2.4 plus or minus 0.8% has been observed during the axis marking with a bubble marker with a total error of 4.9 degree plus or minus 2.1 degree in toric IOL alignment. So coming to the reference marking in, so let me have a one or two word about the cyclotorsion. Patient's change of position from upright to the supine position induces an average positional change of almost around 4.1 degree. So mark the patient of 0, 90, 180 degrees with the patient sitting up looking straight. See different type of markers available in the market, but the intent and the principle remain the same. Marking the intended incision site, intended final position is very, very important. See, this is about the nudes bubble marker. You can see here. This is a short video. I'm just showing you how exactly this marking, how you mark the horizontal meridian marking. So always prefer to do under the sit lamp, but if you are well versed with the patient in a sitting position, always prefer to put the good speculum where patient cannot squeeze that much. So this is the one marker I think always Dr. K.K. Mehta used to tell his or most of his presentation before about the Akaweshi marker. This is also principle behind the bubble marker only, where when you do the proper marking, you can see the green light in the Akaweshi marker so that your marking has done the perfectly well. This is the one, one or two point I want to tell about the smartphone gyroscope. Thanks to our friend uh, Saurav Patwardhan who has uh, developed this smartphone gyroscope. After marking, 
patient sitting in the supine position then uh, patient sitting then you mark it then with the help of this gyroscope you take a click once you take a click then um, uh, it has got a reference how exactly whether you are marking has done properly or not then go to that setting then make sure that where exactly then it will tell that how much is see in this picture you can see there is a three degree which has been oversighted so you can it will tell that how much is your axis to put how much where you have to put the lens this is going to give this is almost accurate in compare with any of the digital system so coming this is the one point i just wanted to tell you one degree of manual rotation always negates for 3.3% of its storicity if it is 0.65 to 3.3% of the cases with more than 10 degree of rotation from the target axis you need to be re rotation so once again i am insisting taking the spin of the iol is very very important coming to the image guided system i think uh, i am well versed with the calisto i with from zai there is varian also true vision 3d as i was telling the best one is the intraoperative abrometry that is ora and hollows so cases undergoing toric implantation assisted with intraoperative abrometry are 2.4 times more likely to have 0.5 degree or less residual astigmatism compared with the other standard method but once again it's very very expensive then coming to the one or two point about the capsular axis i think you need to do a proper capsular axis around 4.5 to 5.5 mm that will make you the result perfect so intraoperative marking i think first marking as i already told can be done either with the, in the patient without sit lamp also but i always do it in front of the sit lamp make sure once you know the axis then i think uh, uh, you take the patient inside the ot i do before the putting the incision where i have to put the lens i mark that first then i go ahead with the surgery this is how you mark iol axis has to be marked see the few words about uh, the zeiss calistra system i think this is the one system i think everything can be incorporated into this system see basically the calistra i matches the reference and the i image with a technically verified matching precision of plus or minus 1 degree in mean for precise markless toric iol impairment so to do that i think you need to have a iol master 700 also this something called zeiss cataract suit it has got iol master 700 then it has taken into a lumira microscope then with the calistry so just patient see you can see the comparison between the manual marking then with the variant but you can see how this zeiss cataract suit result almost 99% the results the accurate you can see we have even marked with the manual then we took the patient and we cross check with this it's almost accurate but once again it gives you a lot of confidence when you are working with such equipment when you are doing a, this premium iols this is one more thing one of the our old video actually you can see some smudging here this you i think you try to avoid smudging because even uh, even 2 degree of misalignment also sometime it may cause uh, some amount of problem so see even this is the lens actually from zeiss the hybrid lens with the hydrophilic with hydrophobic surface it is a four haptic lens normally the uh, uh, the astigma the, the whatever the toricity is both on the anterior and the posterior surface of the lens and it has got a long view how you can view it very easily even in case of a constricted pupil so always never ever forget to remove the viscoelastic underneath the lens this is the key take home message when you are operating a toric iol so even this axis of iq it is a sort of a open loop lens but the principle is same that here you have to be more accurate while placing beta it has got a dotted mark on the lens rather you have to align it properly once again make sure that you remove the viscoelastic underneath the lens so the one more best method to put the toric lens is injection under the bss is very important here the amount of viscoelastic will not be putting any viscoelastic underneath the lens so chances of lens rotation will be much lesser of post operatively so parallax is the difference in the apparent position of the object viewed along with the different lines of the side so where is the high risk of rotation in case of myopes young young individual always i use capsule tension ring prophylactically tend to round the capsule back disturb the tension equally in conclusion toric intraocular lens is the best option available to correct corneal astigmatism during the cataract surgery it gives commendable spectacle independence for distance correcting the astigmatism is all more important from premium iols where the patient expectation are higher 
Conclusion, having image guided system with inbuilt interoperate abrometry along with the surgery done by a femtosecond cataract platform gives us the best result, but closest to the perfect. But you have to think about the cost also. Therefore, manual marking with a smartphone gyroscope optimization, self sealing incision, 5M central round capsular axis, perfect IOL alignment, complete visco removal gives us the recipe of success. Thank you, one and all. So our next speaker, I think Dr. Sunil Ganekal, before that, any questions you can ask me or we can go ahead with the Sunil Ganekal's presentation. Sunil, you can go ahead. Can you hear me? Sunil, unmute. You stop sharing, I'll share my screen. Now. I already stopped. Okay. I have one question to Dr. KP. Uh, when, do you, when will you consider a, a, a toric IOL repositioning or a re-rotation if there is some amount of uh, residual astigmatism post-surgery? So post-surgery, actually, what uh, first of all, the, we need to ask the patient's complaint. How much is the patient visual acuity? If the Even though there is a, some amount of... Um, um, rotation with the cylinder showing around 0.75 or one cylinder, then we can, if the patient doesn't have any complaint, we can just leave it like that. But if the patient is, for example, if he is having a blurring of the vision for the distance, when you take a autorefractometer, normally it gives a, a reading of combination of a plus and minus cylinder. So this is the time I think you have to really think about that. You have to rotate. See, David Chang always tell in his presentation what he used to do, uh, all his toric IL implantation, he implant them, he make the patient to stay in the hospital for four hours. Then after four hours, he'll have a look that whether the lens has been rotated or not. Within four hours, if it is not rotated normally, he sends the patient back. I think this is the proper way to do that. I think that's what we are not following. I think coming days, I think if we do it, I think that will really avoid a rotation of IA. And one more thing I want to tell you, I think my personal opinion, these four haptic lenses from Carl Zeiss really work re very well. Once you put it in the exactly in the position, if your axis alignment is ultimate, the chances of rotation within the back postoperatively is much lesser compared to the open C loop. Thank you. Okay. Uh, am I audible? Yeah, audible, Sunil. Go ahead. Yeah, let's talk about the pseudophagic astigmatism. The cataract surgery nowadays is becoming more of a refractive surgery. Studies have shown that approximately 35 to 40% post patients post cataract surgery tend to have a residual more than one diopter of astigmatism. If a patient is asymptomatic and if he has got a residual refractive error of equal to or more than 0.75 diopters, better to correct that residual astigmatism. So what are the challenges of correcting pseudophagic astigmatism is one is cataract wound healing is unpredictable. Surgically induced astigmatism can be surprising. And most often, we don't uh, tend to look at the corneal astigmatism, like things like measuring posterior corneal astigmatism and other things, especially in patients with ag against the rule astigmatism. The causes for pseudophagic astigmatism could be uh, we don't consider the total corneal astigmatism or we don't take into consideration topographic astigmatism. We tend to take only SIMK, especially in with the rule astigmatism patients, SIMK overestimates the total corneal astigmatism. In against the rule patients, the SIMK underestimates the total corneal astigmatism. So better to consider total corneal astigmatism than the SIMK alone. Surgical errors during toric eye oil implantation, rotation, effective lens position could be altered in uh, toric eye oils. Suppose a patient has got an eye pre-existing astigmatism, incision induced, suture induced, eye oil tilt, all these things can contribute for the astigmatism. I tend to follow a rule of two. That means to say the refraction has to be stable for two months. Uh, at least two months I will wait before I consider any intervention. Errors could be in the form of keratometry reading or in the biometry, incorrect toric calculations, as well as uh, all these parameters as along with that posterior corneal astigmatism and effective lens position. The patient selection itself can be, could be poor. Suppose if you operate on irregular astigmatism patient, dry eye, zonular instability, or you could have chosen a suboptimal IOL. These are the causes for the uh, residual astigmatism. Toric IOL implantation, inadequate or improper marking, all these things has been... Uh, Addressed by the KPI, I will not go into the details of it. Even the rotation can occur. KP stressed on the viscoelastic. Other things one should look for is the 
hypotony post operatively or leakage also causes rotation inadequate design or material of the iol and the patient factor is especially i myopes large capsular back patients tends to have a rotation of the iol what are the treatment options for pseudofecal astigmatism you have got an iol related procedures you have got a corneal procedures iol related procedures basically self fixated iol toric iol rotation iol exchange in some patient you can do a supplementary sulcus placed fakic iols corneals prk lasik and astigmatism keratotomy can be considered coming on to the sulcoflex or the sulcus fixated toric iols the pre op post op refraction should be stable in this patient the primary requisite is the primary iol should be capsular back fixated and sulcus should be free so the the things which you require are the subjective refraction target refraction axial length anterior chamber depth surgical induced astigmatism incision locations all these things can be entered into these parameters then you will tend to get an iol power of sulcoflex iol to be used let me show you a small video of a sulcoflex here is a patient had an uh, patient had an uh, astigmatism uh, uh, this is a iol which has been marked anybody who is well versed with the placing in uh, Uh, topical phaco with the foldable iol implantation can do this procedure the loading of the lens is similar to any foldable iol once you load that just inject into the clear corneal incision into the sulcus make sure that the primary iol is well centered once you do that you can rotate the sulcoflex iol into required axis or the desired axis which was already indicated in nomogram once you do that you can remove the viscoelastic if you want you put can uh, use a intraoperative pilocarpin also to constrict the pupil usually pi is not required in these cases because there is a clear cut space between the primary iol as well as the sulcoflex iol so you can dial it into the the marked position preoperative marked position that's how it's well centered iol this is a sulcoflex toric iol from rainer you can confirm the axis also so toric iol misalignment can occur if there is a defective marking procedure or uh, manual marking methods are used but preferably whenever there is a toric misalignment is there just look into the method in which the marking was used and the uh, technology which was used in the pre operative period whether the abrometry was used or whether the automated system was used or manual marking was done sometimes the patient's eye has to be closely looked at in suppose one eye has got an uh, decentered uh, or a misaligned toric iol well, you should be very careful because patient itself is a risk factor for toric iol well rotation so toric iol well rotation is a very straight forward procedure you can use any online toric uh, calculators which are available which detects the the degree of rotation which has to be done so here the you can uh, once the calculation mark is done where the iol is currently located mark how much the, it is necessary to rotate and you can rotate the iol easily but it is easier to do in the early post operative period in the than in the late post operative period coming on to the corneal procedures the prk is the commonest and simplest of the procedures you can correct low levels of astigmatism but one thing you should remember is before touching on going for a corneal procedure please look at the posterior capsule if the posterior capsule is thickened or caused a stria or something just do a small opening in the posterior capsule because most of the some of the symptoms may disappear by doing a simple ac capsulotomy before doing a prk prk is difficult in older patients because they tend to have an irregular thickened epithelium which may alter the refractive procedure refraction and they could have associated systemic disease like diabetes or comorbidities like lid laxity all these things contribute for the complications associated with prk other thing is there is a mild to moderate pain associated with uh, prk and there is a prolonged visual recovery and the, the other thing is if there is a prolonged visual recovery in a teeth i propose the patient has got a cataract in other eye the visual rehabilitation or ambulatory vision could be difficult in these patients so one should be very careful in such scenarios other thing is one may need not have access to excimer laser in all the all the settings uh, lasik has got advantages faster recovery but uh, need to be careful in older patients iol exchange definitely should be considered one uh, cannot do an iol rotation or if the corneal procedure cannot be is contraindicated you can do an iol exchange procedure iol exchange is uh, definitely whenever you want to do an iol exchange please go through the previous case sheets of the original iol and uh, whether the pre operative astigmatism or with the rule or against the rule and current position of the toric iol should be noted small large capsular excess fusion of the anterior and posterior capsule or if there is a tear in the capsule it could be a risk factor for iol exchange the another uh, corneal procedure which helps in astig the correcting astigmatism is astigmatic keratotomy 
where we make an uh, peripheral arcuate incisions to cause a micro incisional gap which causes the flattening in the steep axis it is a very cost effective accurate and easy uh, procedure the patients with myopic astigmatism are the ideal patients for astigmatic keratotomy so what you require is a what basically preoperative refraction corneal topography astigmatic keratotomy in nomograms you can use the diamond blade for a fixed depth of around 600 micrometers you can do on one side or both side depending upon the residual astigmatism and younger patients you tend to have a longer incision when compared to the older patients let me show you a small video of an astigmatic keratotomy we are an arcuate incisions being done in the periphery beyond the 8 mm clear zone it is done on the both the sides using a 600 micrometer fixed depth diamond blade you can clearly make an arcuate incisions so it causes a gaping in that uh, axis whichever the uh, you can extend the, the length of the axis arc and other thing depends upon the based on the nomogram you can do it out you can use a femto laser to create an astigmatism keratotomy that is called femto laser assisted arcuate keratotomy sometimes you can avoid the surface and you can do a just infrastromal uh, astigmatic keratotomy which will be less invasive when compared to the conventional femto laser assisted this is a video showing in uh, femto laser arcuate incision which is being done so it does help in uh, correcting the astigmatism rarely in some scenarios uh, like in this patient with an post rk we had a residual a spherical as well as cylindrical error you can use a supplementary phakic eye oil into the sulcus and uh, align into a proper axis to get rid of the pseudo phakic astigmatism can you chinappa will be speaking to you about the phakic eye oils i don't go into the depth of this uh, video so in conclusion evaluation is a key and uh, to plan treatment for pseudo phakic astigmatism corneal or eye oil procedure you can choose based on the evaluation sometimes both the procedures corneal and eye oil has to be combined like bioptics to in extreme cases to tackle the pseudo phakic astigmatism thank you for patient hearing and uh, thanks for the opportunity dr krishna prasad and aos scientific committee thank you thank you one and all Thank you, Bill. And uh, it was it was uh, illustrative about how we how we go about uh, tackling sort of fakey assessment. Have you had any experience using fakey cavities in uh, uh, residual astigmatism? One one patient I used that was a post RK patient who had a both spherical as well as uh, astigmatism residual astigmatism. Okay. So when do you think? I mean. Okay. Uh, do you want to tell us anything about how we calculate the the lens power in these cases it's basically you have to topography is an ideal thing topographic refraction better reliability than a manifest refraction so you would say that like you know you will you will base your fakey kyl power based on the topographic refraction yeah, yeah 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 the than the keratometric refraction and then the the sizing and everything is the same as any same same thing same thing what you do for a, for a conventional fakey kyl I have used an IPCL. I have not used an ICL because of the uh, the cost oh, issues. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, okay Dr. Sun. Thank you, thank you. Chana, I will be leaving for the other hall. Please excuse me for that. Thank you. Yeah, that's that's fine. We will be taking care of things. And next we have a uh, uh, next speaker coming up. So I will request to call upon uh, Dr. Dr. Anand. Anand will be talking about astigmatism management. in keratoconus cases which is a very relevant topic wherein the amount of astigmatism and the irregularity of astigmatism usually puts us in very difficult situations over to you dr anand question uh, share my screen is my screen visible Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes. Good morning. Uh, yes, good morning. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning. 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 Good We called as non-inflammatory disease, but now we have been able to identify the inflammatory markers within the cornea. I always refer this to as inflammatory disease. Keratoconus is a disease where the cornea thinning happens, and the end result of which is it starts developing a astigmatism. It starts as a skewing of the axis. It progresses to obliquity. It enlarges. It becomes irregular. 
keratoconus management is all about managing the regular to irregular astigmatism or oblique to irregular astigmatism majority of the times these days because of the better diagnostics in especially in the tertiary care centers we are able to diagnose much and more number of keratoconus but in primary or secondary care centers the clues which are given by the keratoconus patients are frequent change of glasses with rubbing and unhappy with their glasses and in the tertiary care centers lasik rejects are always suspected for keratoconus and whenever we talk of keratoconus there are two to three things which comes into my mind from first day keratoconus suspect and subclinical keratoconus all these three things they look similar but there is a difference in topography in each and everything we need to understand the minute difference between these three things because these are the very 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 early stages of keratoconus ffkc means it could be the fellow eye of a clinically manifested contralateral keratoconus eye it doesn't have any clinical signs topography signs may not be there except for minimal skew in a keratoconus suspect there are so many definitions which are given by multiple uh, scientists according to rebnots there could be no slit lamp findings there could be no scissoring and we can see a skewing with asymmetric bone impact and for subclinical keratoconus they have given a criteria for major and minor criteria where all the indices are altered but clinically on slit lamp you not find any signs added to this when we assess for the biomechanics the corner resistance and the hysteresis is significantly reduced in all subset of early keratoconus when compared to the normal keratoconus patients and dr rohit was mentioning in stock that vertical coma and horizontal coma is one of the important operations that abnormally gets elevated in a very early keratoconus patients that has to be kept in the mind in a lasik vision so these are the things which everyone is aware we should be kept on the mind whenever we diagnose keratoconus and we should also pay importance while managing the astigmatism to the risk factors which add up to the progression of the keratoconus this is the simple chart which simply explains how we are going to manage the astigmatism in keratoconus the protocol has been completely changed after the procedure of cetrier has been adopted in our practice if we document a clear cut case of progression with associated risk factors on a first shot we are going with a cpr and we are going to rehabilitate the patient with spectacles or contact lenses which i'll be describing in the next slide if the patient is of low or moderate risk if it seems to be non progressive in nature we can start observing by rehabilitating him with contact lens or spectacles if it is progressive if the patient is contact lens tolerant we can do cpr and advise him to go with contact lenses if he is intolerant we have procedures where the lasik is uh, combined with cpr and we have intacts followed by icl which i'll be explaining this is the important chart that has to be kept on our mind this explains the complete management of keratoconus there are invasive and non invasive procedures coming on to the glasses usually glasses are well tolerated at the power of minus 2.5 if it is beyond 2.5 if the patient visual acuity is not improving beyond 6.9 we may have to shift him for contact lenses and the contact lenses have major advances these days we have soft orics we have rgps and we have scleral lenses soft lenses is not a best choice if the cylindrical power is more than 2.5 the problem with soft lenses is they rotate with the blink this itself will cause a fluctuating vision and these soft lenses they are very more prone to dry out and it's ideal only for early keratoconus patients rgp lenses are optically superior when compared to the soft they are bigger than the, they are very smaller than the soft contact lenses and they are better for higher degrees of astigmatism the advantage because of its hardness they get al aligned along the curvature to provide a superior and stable vision since they are very small the repeated interaction with the lit margins causes discomfort and patient may not accept it easily to overcome this scleral lenses has been developed 
these are very bigger lenses than RGP and slightly bigger than the soft lenses. Comfort levels are very good and they usually do not dry out. The only side effect is they are expensive when compared to other good lenses. This is how the bad fitting appears and if it's a good fit, it needs to appear like this. C3R entirely changed the scenario. As I told you, if we have documented a progression, if there's associated factors, we need to go with the C3R, either the routine protocol or an accelerated C3R. Both gives fantastic results. We know the principles, how it works. Solutions are available earlier when it was uh, uh, procedural started. We had ribofobin coming up with the dextron, which is high molecular weight. We need to completely remove the epithelium. Now, we started using 0.1 ribofilm, the HPMC, which can go through the intact epithelium, where we can uh, do it on epithelium on procedures. And the majority of these CTR procedures, the effectivity remains the same. Once it is stabilized, I prefer to do a PRT based on the Athens protocol. People who have access to topographic treatment, they do combine collagen cross-linking with the topographic exam procedure. Since I have, we at Lotus, we have topo guided for any early astigmatisms, which are less than minus two, I prefer to do a wavefront guided procedure. But to do this, Latins has given a protocol that we should not ablate more than 50 microns. Minimal pre-op thickness of the patient should be more than 450. Do not make it less than 380. And since there is a tendency of phase because of eczema and the c 3 procedure, do apply mitomycin 0.02% for 20 seconds. Or if you have an option for epithelial removal with eczema, you can go with options of PTK. Uh, so laser in keratoconus is an option. Risk of actase is not documented. We have done around 40 to 50 patients. Patients are doing good. I was just worried about the haze. So we do keep them on chloromethylone for three to four months. Here, hematropy is never a goal. It is just to reduce the power of astic medicine. This is the most important thing that is widely followed. Once the astic medicine is well stabilized with the c 3 we can go on opt for ICU. Again, the toric ICL is to reduce the glass dependency, not for complete glass-free vision. Intax has been an option in the past. Uh, we stopped this doing these procedures way back in 2014-15, but here you need to have a minimal thickness of 450 microns in the 6mm zone to stabilize the cornea. The channels can be either made manually or through the femto-assisted procedure. So if the keratoconus is very advanced, the final option is PKP or dye. And finally, while managing the astigmatism, do not forget to assess the progression at all stages. How to define this progression? You should be able to document the increase in 0.5 diopters in two or more keratometric values in the steep meridian between two sagittal maps. If there is a significant coronal reduction by 10% or more at the thinnest point, based on your pentacam readings, or if you clinically see a significant jump in objective values of astigmatism and refraction, and watch out for the aggressive factors such as eye rubbing, VKC, and other. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Anand. That was uh, a very informative talk about how we manage uh, irregular astigmatism and the multiple options that we have. Uh, thank you for your talk. And uh, if there are uh, any questions from the other panelists, we will take them. Um, if there are no questions, then I will request Dr. Hari Prasad to come in and talk about post keratoplasty astigmatism management. Is Dr. Hari there? Yeah. Yeah. yeah good morning, uh, everybody. At the outside, I'd like to thank uh, AI Scientific Committee and uh, Dr. Krishna Prasad sir for uh, giving me this opportunity. Today, I'll be talking about the management of post keratoplasty astigmatism. Keratoplasty uh, is considered to be uh, the most successful of all the transplant procedures till date. And usually, the survival rate is around 90%. 
But the ultimate success of the transplant is not only determined by the clarity of the graph, but also on the visual uh, quality in the patient. As you can see here, there are two clear graphs, but on the uh, on your right side, the, the, the clear graph, the visual acuity in that patient is quite poor because of higher aesthetic medicine. As compared to the uh, picture in the left side, the patient has quite a good uh, vision acuity due to uh, lesser aesthetic medicine. So it is said that around 15 to 30% of the patient have uh, post-operative aesthetic medicine of more than five diopters. There are many factors which can contribute to uh, post keratoplasty uh, astigmatism. Preoperatively, coronal scarring, coronal vascularization, peripheral thinning as in ectatic conditions can uh, lead to uh, astigmatism post keratoplasty. Intraoperative factors like uh, suture length, uh, suture tension, orientation can also lead to astigmatism post operatively. And then your, so the graph sizing. Graph centration also plays an important factor in determining uh, your ultimate astigmatism post-operative. In the post-operative period, uh, period, factors like uh, surface inflammation, epithelial healing, edema, and uh, graph force symmetry also plays a part in determining the astigmatism post-operative. There are a few factors among these where the uh, surgeon as actual control over uh, determining the astigmatism post-operatively. One of them is uh, trephination of the cornea. As we all know, mechanical trephination can lead to torsional effect on the cornea, which in turn uh, causes irregular edges and discrepancy between the recipient and the donor cornea. Well, if we use the vacuum trephines, all these irregularities and eccentricity of the uh, graft is minimized. So vacuum trephination is pretty much advised. Another factor where surgeon has control is cardinal sutures. So correct position of these four cardinal suture is of utmost importance because this actually determines the overall symmetry of tissue distribution in the patient. The amount of astigmatism tolerated depends upon the age, lifestyle, and presence of binocular or binocular vision in the patient. Usually, patient uh, tolerates up to four diopters postoperatively. In the first month after keratoplasty, the surgeon should focus on rehabilitating the surface, treat the dry eye, and uh, epithelial healing. Uh, at the end of three months after keratoplasty, focus should be on doing the uh, topography and knowing the surface regularity. And also, one can do refraction and determine the spiro cylinder in the patient. So one of the most uh, conservative methods to control the astigmatism postoperatively is uh, using spectacles, but they have a very limited use in uh, high astigmatism or irregular astigmatism. So in such cases, we can use contact lens because these days we have multi multicode lenses with uh, increased diameters, which have increased success chance in uh, controlling irregular and higher astigmatism. But they have issues like uh, graft infection, vascularization and scarring. So even after that, uh, it is said that around 10 to 20% patients after keratoplasty cannot be satisfactorily uh, treated for astigmatism, even by spectacle or contact lens. In such cases, suture removal or adjustment can be done. So selective suture removal can be done initially, wherein uh, after doing a topography, steepest uh, meridian is determined and so selective suture removal is done at the steepest uh, meridian first to flatten it. Usually this can be done as early as uh, three months, at the end of three months when the surface is stable enough and the wound is also healed. Usually we remove only one suture at a time and subsequent non-adjacent sutures can be removed after an interval of four to six weeks based upon the astigmatic values. So if you are using running sutures, this uh, uh, tension adjustment can be done as early as two to four weeks post-operatively, but the risk of uh, uh, suture slippage or breakage will be always be there. So once all the sutures are done and uh, if the patient is still having vision debilitating astigmatism, one can uh, uh, go for incisional keratotomy. This can be done as early as three to four months after complete suture removal. The main principle here is to flatten the steep corneal meridian either with arcuate 
or transverse incisions. So this causes reciprocal steepening in the flat meridian also, which is called as coupling effect. So incision is usually placed in the graft root host interface or in the donor cornea, usually not in the host cornea. This can be done either manually, mechanized or with femtosecond laser. And there are various nomograms to decide it, so I'll not go into it. But one of the major disadvantages with the incisional keratotomy is its poor predictability and the chances of coronal perforation or wound dehiscence. So following the same principle of in incisional uh, keratotomy, one can also use intracorneal ring segments. These can be placed after three months after complete sutural removal to be placed in the donor cornea, not at the graft root interface or the host cornea, to be placed in the donor cornea. So now with the advent of newer uh, eczema laser machine, one can even use uh, eczema laser, uh, laser to uh, treat the spiro cylinder uh, correction in the patients. But one of the major drawback is the astigmatism correction is usually subnormal. It's not very accurate. And the predictability also is not very that great. So patients usually land up with enhancement or regression. So patients who have very high astigmatism, they can be considered for wedge resection. Here, basically, two curvilinear incisions are placed. One curvilinear incision, first one is placed usually on the graft host interface. And the other one is placed on the host cornea, angled to the first one. And the intervening uh, tissue is then excised. And, the, and then the both uh, edges are sutured with uh, interrupted sutures. So this is usually done on the flatter axis, not on the steeper axis. So this usually corrects up to 12 to 20 diapers of astigmatism. Again, as in uh, any incisional uh, keratotomies, but uh, wedge resections results are also very much unpredictable. So not, not a very much a preferred technique to treat astigmatism. So at the end, if the patient develops cataract after keratoplasty, one can always remove the cataract and place a customized toric lenses. Usually this will be helpful in uh, cases who have regular astigmatism because irregular patients with irregular astigmatism are not ideal candidates to place toric eyes. In very much younger patients or with the clear lenticular status, one can use even fakic eyes, which can treat the astigmatism part up to a certain extent. But chance of rotation, cataract formation, and endothelial decompensation is an issue. If any of those, all the previous interventions I mentioned don't work out, one can even think of doing a radical option of doing a regraft, but usually no one does it. So to conclude, uh, I would say that uh, tra any transom procedures, the, some chance of high or irregular astigmatism uh, might be there. So this might be a source of frustration for both the patients and the corneal surgeons. So the focus should be on uh, following a very good uh, surgical technique intraoperatively and uh, manage the postoperative astigmatism properly so as to uh, meet the patient visual ex expectations. Thank you. Thank you, Hari, for this wonderful talk. I think uh, you had enlightened uh, exactly how after the keratoplasty, the re, how to reduce the astigmatism is very important. One question to you. See, a lot of people like, see, uh, got a even facility of femto options also. See, if you are having the option, okay, the patient comes to you for keratoplasty, having the option both for femto and manual, which one you prefer and what are the advantage of having a femto over manual? So femto with femto, we can have different uh, graft uh, designs, sir. Donor top designs like zigzag, top hat, mushroom. So those usually give a very uh, good uh, graft root interface union. So the amount of astigmatism, amount of uh, chance of irregularity at the graft host uh, interface is very much minimal and healing takes place very fast. And the refractive error at the end of the procedure also is very much minimal. So if the, if the setup and the surgeon has that access to the femtosecond technology, then they can go ahead with it. If not, manual is also pretty much good. Thank you, Harry, for your wonderful talk. I think uh, oh, after the keratoplasty, I think still 
you are told in your talk also about the icl how icl is going to manage in reducing the astigmatism we have with us dr chinappa ag he is from uh, he is a visiting consultant prasad netralaya group of hospital also he runs a hospital iksha netralaya at uh, madikeri prolific phaco and uh, refractive surgeon i can uh, every time i call him as a pan of the medicist who can do from anterior segment till the posterior segment so i want his comment i want his presentation on toric icl when and how to cracking the astigmatism over to you chinappa good afternoon everybody first of all i'd like to thank dr kp for giving me this opportunity to be in this uh, instruction course toric icl is a very safe effective strong durable and reliable predictable way of cracking astigmatism and the versatility of indications that are there for a toric icl is makes it all the more important to have it in your surgical armamentarium i will be dealing and telling you when and how we can use it basically the preoperative indications the the preoperative measurements and the intraoperative uh, do's and don'ts toric icl is is a is a when i say icl or a fakie kyl i am i'm talking about a posterior chamber fakie kyl which actually goes and sits in the sulcus so the icl is actually a collamer lens which is a proprietary material to uh, the star surgical company it has a very wide range of prescriptions like you know even in a in a myopic astigmatism hyperopic astigmatism even in plain astigmatism to so as less as minus 0.5 with 5.5 cylinder plus 0.5 with 5.5 cylinder we can still uh, treat these kinds of astigmatism with uh, toric icl and as it is already uh, mentioned uh, in a by previous speakers yes irregular astigmatisms are always a tough nut to crack can we correct it with the icl no i mean we you know we'll have the same amount of uh, success like in any other any other modality of treatment but the quality of vision that we achieve with an icl because of its closeness to the nodal point and it is increased retinal image size makes it all the more better or or as a very uh, reliable option to go ahead and use it in 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 in, 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 in most situations it's it sits far away behind the endothelium so the 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 reservation that some surgeons have that it could have an effect on the endothelial cell count is on so because of it is closeness to the nodal point like i already told you the wow factor that we can achieve with very high astigmatism along with myopia or hypermetro is something that the, the patients are very very happy about because the toric design is designed on the same platform as the other icl so the stability of the icl has been proven for more than about 13 to 14 years now so so the advantage of it being in the sulcus and the 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 uh, the shape of the icl or the design of the icl being very snugly fit into the sulcus makes it very predictable even in 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 very in the very long run so the reversibility of of this procedure also makes it all the more attractive because when you go ahead and treat very high astigmatisms on the cornea the amount of tissue that you remove and the chances of ectasia that 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 you put the patient to is is taken care of when you are dealing with an icl so now coming to the optical zone the optical zone in these icls i mean toric toric icl same okay. as as the the optic range that i have showed in a myopic or a hypopic icl so we get an optical zone of almost about equivalent to the corneal plane about 7.6 when you have a, a dioptric range up to minus 9 so if we can get an optical zone of as big as that that cannot be matched when you when you are actually treating on the cornea so the kind of the the wideness of the the optical zone makes the visual outcomes amazing for the for the patients when we use toric icls or toric toric epicarols coming to indications yes it is said that we have to use it between 21 to 45 but we all know that we use it from as less as 18 years of age so having an acb of more than 3 we can actually go down to as less as minus as less as 2.8 
angles. We don't usually do a gonioscopy in all patients, but if you have a suspicion of the angle being angle being low, then a, then a, then a, a gonioscopy has to be done. Previous corneal surgeries or any kind of an intraocular surgery, we have to take carefully. Contraindication, yes, uh, small anterior chamber depth and narrow angles may be the most important contraindication that we have to keep in mind. And in patients who are closing towards 40, 35 to 40, also look very closely for nuclear sclerosis changes. And if they do have that, then ICL is not an adjustable option. There are other off-label indications like, like it's already been discussed, post-refractive surgery residual astigmatisms, post-cataract surgery residual astigmatisms, and post-keratoplasty residual astigmatisms. In all this, toric ICL can be a good choice. And in the preoperative assessment, like I told you, the most there are a few important things that I want to tell you. First is the refraction. The refraction or the subjective refraction is what the power of the ICL is based upon. So doing a very good uh, subjective refraction, but at the same time also doing the topography to know that the subject at, at what level the astigmatism is. Dr. Rohit Shetty has elucidated very clearly about uh, uh, those points, so I, I, I won't be treading there. And then the other measurements that we have to be very clear about are these three things. The anterior chamber depth, the wide to wide diameter in that, in that order, well, anterior chamber depth, wide to wide diameter, IC angle, AC depth, then the axial length. The axial length and axial length is very uh, necessary if at all you have a complication in you intraoperatively and you uh, go ahead and breach the anterior capsule, you should have a IOL power ready in such situations. Coming to a refraction, like I already told, uh, a contact lens refraction can be done, but most of us don't do it. But the cytoplegic refraction. Coming to anterior chamber depth, the anterior chamber depth. Admin, please mute calculate. all other people. Admin, please mute all other people. The ACD is calculated from the endothelium to the anterior capsule and not from the epithelium. Also, always make sure if you are using any equipment like the IOL master or the ultrasound, you have to negate the pachymetry values to get the actual ACD value. Coming to the overall anterior chamber, yes, when we check the anterior chamber depth, we are actually checking at the center of the pupil. But then the peripheral anterior chamber could be narrow. In such cases, when you do, and it's always better that we do an anterior segment OCT and know that. And if that is the case, do a gonioscopy. Rule out any kind of an angle pathology before going in and choosing an arterial uh, ICL. Wide to wide diameter, the most, most, most determinant fact for success of an ICL surgery is the wide to wide diameter. So sizing it well is all uh, is very important, especially in toric ICLs. If the toric ICL rotates, if you have a, a wrong wide to wide diameter, the toric ICL is bound to rotate and you will have erroneous outcomes and, and very unhappy patients. How do you measure the white to white? Take the patient to the OT, make the patient lie down under the microscope, put a speculum and use a digital caliper. When you use a digital caliper, always make sure that you're checking from mid limbus to mid limbus so that, that you get a, a very accurate value of the white to white. This actually, there is a, there is a correction factor given in the in the uh, in the software which actually calculates for the white to white and makes adjustments for the sulcus to sulcus but the most uh, the best way to uh, to measure the sulcus to sulcus would be doing an ultrasound biomicroscopy so that there are no surprises so yes iol master and ob scan does give you a very uh, i mean you know does give you a white to white but then there are some correction factors that you have to keep in mind in an IOL master actually shows an excess of 0.34 compared to the caliper and about 0.5 excess compared to the OPS scan. So always keep this in mind because optical biometries are getting more and more common these days in practice. So you will be tempted to use your optical biometer but tread carefully and know that there are some correction factors that you need to use. If you do not size your ICL well, one, the toric ICL will rotate and you'll get erroneous results. Number two, you can, you can end up with cataract or glaucoma. A low vault will cause a glaucoma and a high vault will, a low vault will cause a cataract and a high vault will cause a glaucoma. So sizing it is extremely important. This is how a toric ICL looks inside the eye and, uh, and outside. So the, the, the toric ICL design is exactly the same as in a spherical ICL. 
the cylindrical or the, the toricity is actually on the anterior surface and always the toricity is a positive notation and it's a plus cylinder and not a minus cylinder. So, so YAG PIs are not needed in most of the myopic ICLs. It is only needed in hyperopic ICLs so, uh, because of the centrifugal technology. So the lens alignment marks, Dr. KP has very, very clearly told us how we go ahead and do toric ICLs, toric IOLs. So this is no different from that. You actually make a, a reference mark on the cornea of 0, 90 and 180, and then you know what axis the ICL needs to be placed. The ICL, the, the axis on which the ICL needs to be placed is already mentioned in the printout. And based on that, you make the interoperative toric marks and you align the toric ICL in that particular axis. So always remember that if the patient's plus cylinder axis is at 90, the lens must be aligned at 90 degree meridian. But there will be a clockwise or an anti-clockwise movement of up to about 20 degrees. So the, the rotation that you need to do is never more than 20 degrees. So clockwise or counterclockwise, it works well for both eyes. So remember, it, it doesn't change. This is a, a photograph of an ICL which has been aligned at five degree on the clockwise position in a in a uh, in a left eye. Okay. So this is the implantation diagram. So the the implantation orientation diagram has to be kept or stuck on at the OT table so that you don't go wrong when you're rotating the IOL because it mentioned clockwise and counterclockwise. So uh, this is like I said, I've already mentioned this. There is no significant ICL rotations that uh, have been studied. So only about in 210 eyes, there's only about 0.5 degree of a misalignment. So the misalignment is extremely low. Piggyback IOLs for piggyback toric ICLs for uh, refractive surprise, astigmatic refractive surprise in cataract surgery has also been proven, but it is not a label uh, indication. It's an off-label indication. But like Dr. Sunil has already told us, the calculation method is exactly the same as what you do in a in a virgin line, but and and the the surgery is much more easier because the anterior chamber depth is usually more in a pseudo fake eye as compared to a, uh, uh, as compared to a fake eye. So in conclusion, toric ICL is an effective way to correct astigmatism. High cylindrical errors. I would always prefer to do a, a, a fake eye platform rather than a corneal refractive surgery. And a subjective refraction in white to white is extremely important. Thank you and. Thanks for the. Uh, Thank you, Chinappa, for wonderful talk. See, there's what uh, uh, probably uh, we've, we've been doing this toric ICLs from a quite long period, but uh, always one of the most satisfying when the patient come to us whenever you operate for ICL, the level of satisfaction will be always uh, much better compared to the any other patient. So, uh, see the now what I just want to ask you. Oh, what is the exact reason? Like, see, uh, you have shown in your uh, couple of slides that uh, even the alignment is little, the with the alignment also the correction is better. But normally in ICLs we get the vision whatever you better vision than the promise. What is the reason exactly you count for this? Can you hear me, Dr. Chinappa? Unmute. Can I take up, sir? Yeah, yeah. Tell me. See, the quality of vision uh, is always uh, well controlled because of uh, spherical operations, chromatic operations, and the dysphotopsic phenomenon. The advantage with the collamer is when you place it in front of the lens, since the refractive index is almost near to the crystal lens, this photopsic phenomenon doesn't happen. That adds up to clarity. Whereas in eczymer, what happens, we are altering the vertically, the horizontally placed corneal lamellae, which in turn reduces the quality of vision. So there is a subtraction here. Here there is no subtraction of the vision. That's why the vision feels good with the ICL patients. And one more point I want to add here, because these lenses are put quite close to the nodal point of the eye. So, since it is near to the nodal point of the eye, it corrects, as you said, that most of the abrasions. So, always the patient, suppose if the patient is having 
best corrected vision with a very high power around 618 but if you put a icl patient may come the vision may come up to 69 parts even they read up to 66 this is the quality of the icls or any fakey lenses but in all compared to any other fakey lens definitely colomer as you said that colomer lens have got a more edge over the other type of fakey lenses available in the market once again i thank everybody uh, i think one question to uh, anand that uh, see on the iol i think you are a prolific fake or refractive surgeon so what is your, in your practice how much is the pre operative astigmatism you really pick them for toric lens implantation toric cataract or icl cataract cataract sir cataract i think uh, uh, the increase in the number has been for the past 2 to 3 years earlier the astigmatism was there maybe surgeons we were hesitant to Now, counsel the patient. How much is the degree of fasting? Whether one diopter or point seven five, you take them for a toric IOL surgery? Minus one, minus one, minus one. Yeah. Minus. So, any comments from the any panelists here? Okay. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Anand Hari Prasad is also here. Thank you, Dr. Chinappa. I also thank Dr. Rohit Shetty who has enlightened us the importance of topography while treating the. Uh, astigmatism and i also thank uh, dr sunil ganekal for his wonderful talk it was in the end we could able to finish in on time we gave a good message to the whole ophthalmic fraternity tackling astigmatism is very very important nowadays whether you do a uh, iol surgery or whether you go out with icl but in the end patient if you want to have a happy patient their astigmatism has to be controlled i thank as for this opportunity i thank hari for the wonderful thank you sir thank you